Welcome. Looking forward for a wonderful evening. Thank you for joining us. I'd like to start by acknowledging that we're gathered today on the traditional territory of the Musqueam, Squamish, and Tsleil-Waututh. And uh, today's presentation is a joint effort between the Department of Computer Science, um, CADA, which is a center for artificial intelligence and decision making and action, and uh, the development and uh, an alumni engagement team of the Faculty of Science. So um, um, I would also like to thank our sponsor, that would be KPMG, and we have uh, uh, Mr. Jamil Ahmed sitting right there. Hello, Jamil. Uh, Jamil is a partner of digital and data analytics at KPMG, KPMG and I invite him to come and say a few words. Introduction, Chen. You, you actually pronounced the name perfectly. So, congrats. Um, good evening, everyone. I'm Jamil. I'm a partner of digital and data analytics at KPMG, an advisor to the Artificial <coughs> Intelligence Network of British Columbia. KPMG is thrilled to be sponsoring this fantastic event, exploring what artificial intelligence means for the next decade in BC. Most importantly, as a catalyst, for driving impact in our communities and where we live and where we do business. KPMG is commit, committed to driving AI forward in Vancouver, specifically when it comes to hiring talent. And recently, KPMG joined forces with AI and BC and the Digital Supercluster, alongside multiple other local organizations and some of you who are here today, uh, supporting the career progression of Canadian women, uh, women in the field of AI. Adopting AI and is and will continue to be a fundamental imperative for responsible organizations in order to embrace new business models, respond to talent shortages, and create efficiencies to remain competitive in the global race for meeting customer and citizen needs. As an organization that has been in the Vancouver fabric for about 120 years, I was shocked when I heard that stat. You know, we understand the need as an organization, you know, traditional accounting and tax organization, to transform. And AI is one of the tools that we're embedding within our organization and bringing that value back to our clients and our communities. So with more awareness, and more support from our provincial and federal governments and organizations such as CADA, AIBC, BC Tech, UBC, and a host of other um, players within our ecosystem. You know, we're changing the identity of Vancouver. We're changing the identity of Vancouver as a major global technology hub. And, you know, we need to come together. We're at the start of the journey, but we need to come together and do more. So I'm keen to learn more from Dr. Gary Marcus and this esteemed panel that we have assembled here today and uh, how they can share their professional experience with us. So thank you. Thank you very much for these nice words, Jamil, and thank you again for the support of KPMG. Very good. Okay, so uh, uh, today's program has three parts to it. We're going to start with a keynote presentation of Dr. Gary Marcus in just a few minutes. Uh, we're then going to follow that with a moderated panel discussion led by Dr. Kevin Brown, who's sitting uh, Kevin Layton Brown, who's sitting here, and then we will <laughs> we will do a, we will have a network a networking reception outside. I'm looking forward to all three parts of this evening. Um, the, uh, let me start uh, with the first part, uh, AI, um, artificial intelligence, the next uh, decade. This is the topic of, uh, of this evening's, evening's presentation by, uh, by Gary. I'd like to say uh, a few words about Gary, if I may. Um, so Gary, sitting here, you'll see him in a minute. 
Bennett. He's a cognitive scientist. He's a best-selling author and he's an inter entrepreneur. He's the founder and CEO of Robust.ai, which is a robotics uh, startup that aims to build the world's first industrial-grade cognitive platform for robotics. He was a professor at NYU. Uh, while he was there, he founded the Geometric, uh, Geometric Intelligence, which is a machine learning company. It was later acquired by Uber. It was part of the, basically helped launch the AI lab of Uber. He is an author of uh, six books, uh, including the New York Times bestseller, Guitar Zero, guitar, not Guitar Hero, Guitar Zero, The Science of Becoming Musical at Any Age. And uh, his most recent title is Rebooting AI, Building Machines We Can Trust. And we actually will have copies of this book at the reception outside at, uh, at the end of uh, this evening. Uh, Gary has a PhD from MIT, earned in 1993 and he has published extensively on topics ranging from human and animal behavior to neuroscience, genetics, linguistics, evolutionary psychology, and artificial intelligence in the best possible venues, science, and nature. And going off script, he has never said anything controversial in his own life. <laughs> <laughs> and with that, that's welcome. I want to start with, uh, oh, am I live? Everybody can hear me? All good? Um, I want to start with a simple Venn diagram to um, do what they call in, in the business world level setting, make sure we're all on the same page. Um, so I'm going to talk about artificial intelligence. Artificial intelligence is not one thing, but many. We have a bunch of experts in different aspects of artificial intelligence here. Um, there's a subset of artificial intelligence, which is called machine learning, which is getting machines to figure things out on their own. And there's a subset of that, which is deep learning. A lot of what I'm going to talk about today is deep learning, because deep learning is the dominant paradigm in artificial intelligence right now. It's one that's generating uh, the most headlines by far, and probably the most revenue by far. But it's not the only thing that we need to figure out in order to solve artificial intelligence. Um, I guess I can do it. Um, and I want to thank my collaborator, Ernie Davis. Um, uh, the book that Ken mentioned, Rebooting AI, is co-written with Ernie. And, um, we have a series of op-eds in the New York Times we've been writing together for the last several years. Um, and almost everything that I say, I've discussed with him at some point or another. So um, he's, he's my frequent co-author. Um, uh, oh, some some uh, fonts did not quite translate, but we'll be OK. Um, uh, on the left, we have Andrew Ang saying, if a typical person can do a mental task with less than one second of thought, we can probably automate it using AI either now or in the near future. This is something that one of the leaders in AI said to Harvard Business Review in an article he wrote. Um, a lot of people, I think, took it very seriously. And if it were true, then it would mean, for example, a lot of jobs would be at stake right away. And the, the quote that's not quite visible there is um, Sundar Pichai, who is now the CEO of Alphabet, which is the parent company of Google, saying that AI is one of the most important things humanity is working on. It's more profound than, I don't know, electricity or fire. And I'm here to tell you that Sundar might be right in the long run. AI might someday, in fact, be more profound than fire or electricity. But right now, if you have the choice of which of these things to leave at home, I'd leave the AI at home and keep the fire and electricity with you. Um, we're a long way away from having AI that's uh, that profound. And there's been a lot of hype about AI for a long time. Um, I could go back many decades, but I'll just go back. Um, 10 years, here's one example of the last few years. Um, Jeff Hinton, who's uh, probably the most dominant figure in AI right now, at least in deep learning, said uh, in 2016, people should stop training radiologists now. It's just completely obvious that within five years, deep learning is going to um, um, be better than radiologists. And he said, if you're working as a radiologist, you're like Coyote, already over the edge of the cliff who has yet to look down. These are pretty strong words. It terrified. I'm not kidding, it terrified a lot of radiologists. There was a lot of soul searching in radiology departments. There are a lot fewer people becoming radiologists now because they said it. This is hype that has had a material effect on the world. Um, on the right, Elon Musk is always making predictions about self driving cars and when they will come. I um, retweeted one earlier today. Um, uh, he he um, estimates that by the middle of 2020, this was from 
uh, last year. The Tesla, the autonomous system, will improve to the point where drivers won't have to be able to pay attention to the road. Do not believe anything Elon Musk tells you about autonomous vehicles, at least not in 2020. Um, here's another one. Wired had a, everybody had in 2015. That was kind of the, the biggest moment of life, I think, for deep learning. Um, we had a Wired story saying deep learning will soon give us super smart robots. My company's trying to build super smart robots. We're pretty up on the state of the art. Let me tell you that in 2020, none exist yet. Um, and uh, also in 2015, the Facebook was going to release this thing called M. Um, it's bold answer to Siri and Cortana. How many of you have used M? Almost none. Um, it was supposed to be the greatest personal assistant ever. It was going to answer whatever questions you might have about anything. Uh, I'll sort of give you the bad news in a minute. Um, so now for a bit of surrealism um, on the super smart robots thing, we wanted Rosie the robot. Most of you probably know, you know this domestic robot from the Jetsons. That's what we want. But we actually have this Roomba. Um, <laughs> uh, Facebook's uh, virtual assistant. It was, uh, which was promised in 2015, was quietly canceled in 2018. And I don't know if we have audio here. We do. Here, um, here's a driverless car trying to go from point A to point B where it's across the street. Guy wants his car to come by itself. And it's looking good, it's looking good. Uh, uh, uh. Oh my God. Not so good. So that was late 2019. Um, if we can't get across the street in late 2019, I'm not too optimistic for the rest. Um, people have died in Tesla's trusting them too much. Um, uh, Jeff Hinton's claim has led to a lot of startups. About 400 startups are working on radiology. Um, so on the left is the number of radiology startups globally. And then on the right is the number of radiologists who have actually lost their job to AI, and it's zero. <laughs> and in fact, there are a lot of radiologists a lot of places where we have shortages of radiologists. So AI hype can have a material negative effect on the world. There's nothing new about AI hype. It goes back to the 1950s, and um, there was IBM Watson about 10 or 15 years ago, well, almost 10 years ago, um, that didn't live up to its expectations. Um, I'm not here to tell you that AI is impossible, but I am here in part to tell us that we need to temper our expectations about what's realistic in, in the near term. Almost all the excitement now is about something called deep learning. So you remember that graph I showed in the beginning. Um, deep learning is the dominant technique for machine learning, which is the dominant approach for AI. You can't really understand where AI is right now and what's possible right now. I'm not talking about 100 years from now. But the current state of AI without understanding something about the strengths and limitations of deep learning. So deep learning is um, a technique where it can be used in a lot of different ways, but the most common way of using it is you feed in something like a picture and a label for that picture. You give a lot of um, these pictures, a lot of labels. We call it supervised learning. And this is simulated, but the next few I'll show are real. Um, eventually, you learn, for example, to tell the difference between Tiger Wood and golf ball um, based on a bunch of uh, labeled examples of this. Um, and one of the most brilliant things that anybody in deep learning did was to call it deep learning. Because um, what that means is there's a lot of layers in this thing called a neural network. But what it implies is a kind of theoretical depth or conceptual depth, the way that, that college students late at night, night might say, man, that's deep. But deep learning is not deep in that sense. Um, so I will, I will establish that for you. So, so here you train a deep learning system on a bunch of elephants. And um, all of those layers uh, change their weights over time, the connections between um, the the um, nodes in these things, and then people say, wow, it's learned what an elephant is, isn't that cool? And it didn't have any prior knowledge about what a trunk is or um, what a mammal is or anything like that. And it looks pretty good, but then if you take it out of the space of examples that it's been trained on, out of the distribution that it's been trained on, um, you get really weird results. So raise your hand if you think that this is a person. <laughs> okay, so, so uh, I knew my friend Frank, who is in, um, impersonating a deep learning system. Thank you, Frank. Um, <laughs> we will come up with that answer. But um, the reason that Frank, the deep learning system, came up with person is because this silhouette doesn't look like those cases. And what's really being learned is mostly about texture. More exercises for Frank here. How many people think that this is a snow plow? <laughs> we didn't practice this in advance, not exactly. Um, and so deep learning systems will say that this is a snow plow because there are lots of labeled examples of snow plows with the texture of snowy roads in the background. 
um, and not a deep understanding of what a school bus is or what it is for something to tip over. Um, the one on the right is a baseball that was made by some uh, students at MIT. It was 3D printed baseball with foam on top, and the system recognized the foam as an espresso and didn't understand that it's a baseball. <laughs> um, one more example, here's a banana. A deep learning system recognizes that just fine. Here's a little sticker somebody initially devised and put next to the banana, and now the deep learning system says that it's a toaster. I'm not going to call on Frank for that one. Um, so the reality is that AI and deep learning have made tremendous progress in some areas, but almost none in others. So speech recognition is really pretty good. You can confirm that by talking to Siri, and it will translate uh, what you're saying. Photo tagging is pretty good. Board games made a lot of progress. And there are other areas where we really haven't made that much progress. So language understanding, Alexa can understand one sentence commands, but Alexa doesn't really understand the world that you're talking about. You can't have a real conversation with it. Um, in general, being flexible, adapting to unusual circumstances is something that people still do a lot better than machines. So machines are much better than most of us at board games, but they're not as good at us at being flexible and adapting to the world. Even driving has actually proven to be pretty difficult. So you know, every normal 16-year-old learns to drive sooner or later, um, and we don't have automatic systems that can match what a normal teenager um, can do, and then medical diagnosis is way beyond. Um, so the way I think about it is there's kind of a regime of big data. We get a lot of data about things that happen all the time. So in driving, that would be um, you can get a lot of data about driving on the highway on ordinary weather. And then we typically have less data for some cases. We call those outliers or edge cases. And we have, when we have what I call small data, these current systems don't do, do that well. To be very crude about it, they're doing something like memorizing the cases that they've seen before, and then if there's something new, if it's close to a case they've seen before, they're okay. The further away it is from that, the worse that they do. So here's that quote, if a typical person can do a mental task with less than one second of thought, blah, 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 uh, very optimistic, and here's my paraphrase of it that I think is um, much less sexy but much more realistic. If a typical person can do a mental task with less than one second of thought, and we can gather an enormous amount of directly relevant data, we have a fighting chance so long as the test data aren't too terribly different from the training data and the domain doesn't change too much over time. <laughs> so thank you. What that's really saying is the techniques we have are really good for board games and things like that, but they're not necessarily good for the real world. So it's no accident that the stunning successes are for things like playing Go and chess and so forth, um, but not for having robots drive around a room like this. So I think of Winston Churchill and what he would have said if he was an AI expert, um, which is deep learning is the lamest form of AI we've got except for all the others. <laughs> I'm going to have to change this slide after the Senate vote tomorrow. Anyway, um, so what can we do about that? Um, the second part of the talk, I'm going to give some insights from the human mind. So my training, as Ken said, is really in the cognitive sciences, um, human intelligence, animal intelligence. Um, and what can we learn from that that can help us maybe to build better AI? So the first thing I would say is we have to stop looking for silver bullets. Cognition is complicated. There's a lot of things that go into our understanding of the world. Intelligence is not one thing, but many. Some of you might know, for example, Howard Gardner's notion of multiple intelligences. There are lots of things that go into intelligence. There's perception, common sense, planning, analogy, language, and reasoning. Um, I'm not saying we should abandon deep learning. I'm saying we shouldn't think of it as a universal solvent. It's just one tool among many. It's part of what goes into perception. It's not even all of perception, but it's an important part of perception. And we should use it for that, but we need to have other techniques as well. Um, some of you might know Daniel Kahneman's book, Thinking Fast and Slow. That's an example of what I would call a hybrid system. He says we have system one, which is fast and reflexive, and system two, which is deliberative and does more like reasoning and so forth. That's an example showing you that the human mind admits a lot of different techniques and not just one. Um, there's an old book by Marvin Minsky that talked about the mind as being a set of like a hundred or something like that, different agents, each of which are specialized for different purposes. I don't think that's an unreasonable way of thinking about the mind. My mentor, um, Steven Pinker, um, Canadian born, uh, wrote a book called Words and Rules based partly on work that he and I did together when I was his grad student, um, talking about how just one little tiny part of human intelligence requires both rules that are sort of like classical artificial intelligence and something like neural networks. So um, if you look at how children learn the past tense of English, just this tiny little microcosm of language, you already find evidence that we have multiple mechanisms um, available. Um, I would argue, in fact, that we want to build a synthesis of two traditions in AI. 
One is the neural network tradition that deep learning represents now, um, which is good at learning, but pretty lousy at abstraction and generalization. And an older tradition that's well represented some, by some people in this room, um, like Alan Mackworth, um, David Poole, um, classical artificial intelligence. And that's probably not on its own going to get us all the way there, but it's much better at abstraction even if it's not as good at learning. What we really need are hybrid models that are going to bring together these traditions. There's, there's a long history of battling between these two sides that I think has to stop. Uh, there we go. Um, second point is I think deep learning has to start with common sense. So common sense is something that John McCarthy talked about in the 1950s and being really important to AI and it left the, the picture a little bit. Um, Ernie Davis, who I mentioned, and I had um, an article summarizing the kind of state of the art in uh, communications of the ACM a few years ago and they did this wonderful picture of a robot cutting down the wrong side of a tree limb. So you don't want to, if, if you build a robot, a forestry robot, to have it learn by trial and error, error over thousands of examples which side to cut down. You want to have some prior knowledge about geometry, physics, um, trees, etc. Here's another example of what I mean by common sense. If I show you something like this, you can very quickly assimilate its purpose. So you can say, well, I tell you that that's a yarn feeder. Probably most of you have never heard of such a thing before. And as soon as I give you the name, you can understand how that little hole relates to the larger ball of yarn and the thread that's coming out. And then you can recognize another one, even if it's not in the training regime. Even if pixel for pixel, it looks totally different. In fact, it's butt ugly. <laughs> and yet still, you can recognize uh, what it's for. That's common sense. Um, another example is um, we know how to build software that can represent what a grader looks like and could have... I don't know, nanobots flying inside um, the grader, but we don't know how to build an AI system that could look at a grader and understand the relation between the structure of it, the form of it, and what its function is. So why do we have, for example, holes on different sides? My grader's on the right, it actually has six sides. So why do you have a grader um, with, with six sides on it? Um, we don't have AI systems that can represent that kind of stuff. And so if you're trying to build a robot that, let's say, works in a kitchen, if it doesn't understand the function of these things, you're in trouble. Um, here's another example, Roomba um, does not understand the difference between Nutella and the stuff that I'm illustrating on the right, um, and this causes problems. There's a word for it, which is called the poopocalypse. Um, <laughs> I read a Facebook post about it that was, from my perspective as a uh, cognitive scientist interested in common sense, too good to be true, and so I did the fact checking on it, um, and uh, somebody actually asked the people at Roomba, is this really true, does this really happen, do you really get poopocalypse when in which the Roomba loses track of where it, um, what it's cleaning and spreads it all over the room. They said, yes, actually, we see this a lot. They actually have a policy about what happens that I can tell you about later. Okay, um, third point is learning isn't just about big data and number crunching. So the way deep learning mostly works, there's you know canonical application, is all of these supervised examples. Um, you have this input, this is the output. Um, here's my daughter uh, at the Whole Foods on Camby Street, or near Camby Street, um, and we're sitting in the cafe, and she looked at this chair, and she decided it would be a fun thing to do to climb um, inside the chair, to climb through the chair. She didn't have a lot of training examples. This is actually the second time that she did it, so um, I, I uh, had the presence of mind to film her the second time, not the first time. And what she does here is actually problem solving and trying to find the limits of her own body and her own understanding of the world. It's not about lots of data. It's not about imitation. I could never do that, even when I was, even before my book tour, when I put on some weight, like I still would never fit through the chair. Um, that was a setup for you later, Frank. You know that. Okay, so um, here she is. She's trying to do it, and she gets stuck. And then she reasons about it. What is the limits of my body? And then she manages to make her way through. This is a completely different paradigm from how most of AI is working now. To reason about problems, physics, etc. cetera. Um, I think that that has to start with an innate understanding of things like time and space and object. I could have um, quoted maybe... Um, Immanuel Kant's Critique of Pure Reason. Here's a modern version of that from the uh, developmental psychologist Liz Felke at Harvard. She says, if children are endowed, endowed innately with the ability to perceive objects, persons, sets, and places, then they could learn something about the world. But if you don't even start with that, you're in trouble, is basically what she's saying. The neural networks that we have now aren't um, innately endowed with understanding of objects, persons, sets, and places. They have to learn everything by correlating pixels and labels and things like that. And I think that's too rudimentary. Um, I won't go through all of this right now, but I think that there's an argument that AI needs to start with some relatively small set of things. So one thing people actually build in is um, called translation invariance that comes in the form of a technical principle called convolution. 
Um, I have been arguing for many years that we need some of the elements of classical AI to be um, fundamental to our AI system, and then you can think about things like causality, understanding that objects move um, on connected paths in space and time and so forth. I would argue until we start building at least some innate structure into our AI, we're probably not going to succeed. Um, I've been giving these slides for a few years, and, and two friends of mine independently just published papers about how there's actually a bias in humans against innateness. So people are probably innately endowed with a bias towards thinking that there's nothing built in, if you can get your mind around that. Um, and as a consequence of that bias, I've given up trying in the space of 20 minute talks to try to persuade people that there's anything innate in the human mind. If I had an hour, I would do that. Um, since I don't, I like to instead show people pictures of baby ibexes. This is a baby animal that's a few hours old. And there's no reasonable way to understand it other than to say there's some innate structure in this creature. This creature has to be born knowing something about three-dimensional geometry, about its own muscles and how they relate, something about how to read the environment that it's in. So if baby ibex can have innate structure, why can't our AI system? And for those who are skeptical and want to control groups, and then To, to sum up, first of all, I always like to leave people with some news they can use. In the event of a robot attack, if I'm wrong about everything else, here's what you can do. Number one, if the robots start coming for us, you can close the door. <laughs> Very few robots that know how to open doors. There are even fewer that know how to unlock doors, even if you give them the key. Um, if that doesn't work, you can hide behind a bus, or dress like a bus, or hide behind a shiny toaster, or keep a pack of psychedelic stickers on hand, or a giant fan to change the physics a little bit, have some banana peels on the floor, or just talk to them in noisy rooms with a fart and accent. They will never <laughs> understand a word that you are saying. In the worst case, climb some stairs. Only one dog, uh, big uh, spot will be able to follow you. Um, most of them not, and none of them will be able to follow you up a tree. All right. Um, Speaking of, of climbing, um, there's an old metaphor that I like, which is that deep learning is a uh, better ladder, but a better ladder doesn't necessarily get you to the moon. Getting to intelligence with the versatility of human beings is kind of a moonshot, and we're not there yet. And it's not clear that just because we have this one technique that's really good that, that we're making progress towards that. In the long run, I do think the sky is the limit. So I agree with Peter Diamandis, who said that strong artificial intelligence, if, we, if and when we get there, could enable crazy advances in medicine, technology, lower prices for everything, um, individual um, freedom to fulfill our dreams. But this is going to require intelligence, um, AI with intelligence and values, and we're not really on that road right now. Right now we're just on a road um, to intelligence that does a lot of data dredging and correlation and so forth. Building a more synthetic field by integrating classical and modern approaches, classical AI and deep learning, along with insights from the human mind, help, might help us bring real progress. And so I'll end, and then we'll do the panel part of, of um, today's uh, presentations. Um, if we want to build machines that are as smart as people, we should start by studying small people. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, uh, Gary. That was uh, absolutely thought-provoking. And uh, I liked your advice about uh, talking with them with a foreign accent. I think I have a little bit of a good setup there. Um, so um, the way we're building this evening is pretty good. We've had uh, Gary speak, and uh, I'm sure that some panelists uh, coming up will have some thoughts about what he said. So they will say their thoughts, and then they will all go out and settle it outside in the reception. So the next part is, uh, is our uh, panel, and uh, for that I'd like to introduce uh, the moderator, Kevin Layton Brown. I think I botched your name because I only know you for like 16 or 17 years, 17 years and we talk every day. Uh, Kevin, uh, Kevin uh, is a professor of computer science at UBC. He's also the director of CADA, uh, which is a sponsor of this event. He holds a, um, a CIFAR AI chair from AMI, which is the Alberta Machine Intelligence Institute. And uh, he's an associate member of the Vancouver School of Economics. He holds an, a PhD and an MSc from Stanford University. But he's, uh, we're uh, 
proud product, or we're proud to have him as a product of Canada. He has a, a, a bachelor's from McMaster, and uh, uh, his research interests are uh, in computer science, at the internet, uh, intersection of computer science and microeconomics. He's an expert on algebra, uh, uh, AGT, algorithmic uh, game theory, and multi-agent systems. Is a program co-chair of the 2021 AAA, AAAI conference on artificial intelligence, and he's really a, an engaging and wonderful teacher and speaker. Looking forward to having you moderate that. Kevin, welcome. pleasure to be introduced as the person who will then introduce yet other people who <laughs> that will at some point speak to you about AI. Um, I, I think a, a theme that we have from Gary's talk is that uh, you know, intelligence is multiple and that it's going to take really different approaches to be sort of brought together to, to achieve you know, a true success in AI. And in that vein, we have multiple intelligences about AI whom we would like to introduce you to. Uh, let, let me invite our panel to come uh, to the stage now, and uh, I'll introduce them to you uh, after they're all sitting down. And, and uh, this panel, uh, we've uh, selected this panel to represent a range of perspectives across academia and industry here in Vancouver uh, to showcase the kind of local uh, depth of talent we have uh, here in AI in the city. And indeed, there, there are many other amazing AI people in Vancouver we could have selected. We really are a hotbed for uh, AI activity. Um, we also selected this panel in the hopes of not bumming you out so much about what AI is going to be capable of in the near future after seeing uh, all of the cautionary tales that Gary is known for providing. <laughs> And uh, so really we're, we're aiming to use this panel to try to tease out um, what you know, our esteemed panelists believe is going to be possible and not possible in AI uh, representing their, their respective points of view um, in, in the next little while um, in AI. So, so let me begin by introducing the panel um, from my left. Um, Dr. Suzanne Gilbert is the founder and CEO of Sanctuary AI. Uh, which is a, a startup uh, based in Vancouver that aims to build ultra-human-like robots, um, which is uh, something that should terrify none of us, I think. You can, you can decide for yourself. Um, after, um, uh, before having worked at Sanctuary, Suzanne was co-founder of Kindred AI, uh, oversaw the design and engineering of that company's human-like robots, and was responsible for uh, developing cognitive architectures, allowing those robots to learn about themselves and their environments. Before that, um, not having thought that AI was hard enough to focus on, Suzanne also worked as a physicist on um, D-Wave, a quantum computing company, um, designing and building supercomputing quantum processors, you know, as we all do at one time or another in our lives, <laughs> and uh, also working on quantum artificial intelligence applications. She got a PhD in experimental physics at the University of Birmingham, um, special specializing in uh, quantum device physics. Um, moving on, uh, Dr. Greg Mori is the research director at the Royal Bank of Canada's Borealis AI Vancouver Lab, uh, but that's not enough to keep him busy. Uh, at the same time, somehow, he's also a professor at, in the School of Computing Science at Simon Fraser University. Uh, he explained to us before the panel that he's 100% time at RBC and also 25% time at uh, NSFU. You do the math. <laughs> it's not enough for you, Greg. Um, he got a PhD in computer science um, from the University of California, Berkeley in 2004, and uh, before that was at the University of Toronto. And uh, his research specialization is in computer vision and machine learning. And as though that wasn't enough, uh, we also have uh, Dr. Frank Wood. <laughs> um, who you guys have met as a foil in Gary's talk already. Um, he promises to be even more combative in the panel. Um, he's an associate professor of computer science at the University of British Columbia, one of my colleagues. Uh, he's a Canada CIFAR AI chair at uh, MILA, the, the Montreal um, Institute for Learning Algorithms, something like that. Um, he's a co-founder of Inverted AI, which is like regular AI but upside down. 
<laughs> uh, which is a, a research lab specializing in machine learning and probabilistic programming, which is a research area that he's one of the, the luminaries and founders of. Um, before joining UBC a couple of years ago, he was an associate professor at Oxford University, and uh, he founded the first web image search engine called Two Fish, and was also CEO of Interfolio, a credential management software company. Um, at, at this point, you must be wondering what I'm even doing here with, with this uh, amazing panel assembled here. So I'm going to take the hint and uh, turn it over to them. Uh, I'll, I'll come sit down and see if it, uh, Frank is graciously keeping warm for me. And uh, I'll, uh, I'll start by asking some questions. So, so the, uh, the theme that we have here is really to allow the panelists to try to respond to what uh, they and all of us have heard from uh, Gary's talk. Um, we have Gary here as well to uh, respond to the response, to, to reflect on what the panelists have said, kind of as he chooses. And after we've gone through a few questions with the panel, we'll turn everything over to you and uh, hear from the audience and give, give you a chance to direct some questions to the panelists or to Gary, kind of as you prefer. So uh, the focus of the panel is to see how it can be less boomy. Is that better? Um, yeah, I can do that. Maybe we'll try that. How's that? Uh, the focus of the panel is, is to think about AI over the next 10 years. Um, that, that's a somewhat arbitrary time horizon, but, but our aim is to think long enough to imagine a world where AI is doing something notably different than it's doing today. We, we've been experiencing rapid change in AI, and uh, there, you know, for all the limitations of AI, clearly there are um, big changes yet afoot. So we're going to ask the panel to consider you know, various things over that timeline, how it's going to affect us as researchers in AI, and how it's going to affect everybody in this room. So the first question that I'd like to uh, just pass through the panel, maybe starting from Frank, because he's closest to me, um, is over the next decade, um, what uh, technologies in AI do you think will start affecting the lives of, of everybody here, the, the, the lives of you know, regular people living in a, a first world city such as our own? I guess I don't see how to say no in the circumstances. Uh, so uh, I guess the, the real question is what kind of AI are we talking about? Are we talking about classification of class regression or are we talking about artificial general you know, in this question, you know, are you expecting AGI to be here the next decade? Well, I think we can we can talk about what's going to happen in these two spectrums. I'd also I'd also like to start by saying that everything that Gary said is wrong. I <laughs> 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 want uh, So I mean, I think it, it, it does make 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 some difference which one we're talking about, right? So I think we can expect a sort of a a, a, a standard progression towards better classification and regression as optimizers get better and neural architecture search finds better neural nets or whatever and various algorithms are scaled and so on and so forth. So like things things will get better, like your credit card won't get canceled as often as you go go abroad or um, that I will be able to get credit in the country as a new immigrant to Canada, you know, which I can't right now for some weird reason. Thanks. I appreciate that. Uh, <laughs> you can see where RBC needs in the Or maybe, maybe uh, UBC needs to pay me more or two. I don't know. Uh, uh, thanks, Ben. Uh, so, or are we are we talking about sort of AGI where we can expect to see? I, 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 I'm much more bullish than. Gary is for sure, but uh, um, where we can expect to see things like the Teslas actually driving themselves, or Evos coming to, to, to fetch you where you are and repositioning themselves over time. Uh, so it, I think both are achievable in the 10 year period, but uh, you know, it depends on which one you're talking Yeah, I think that might have just been your answer, but uh, I, I think really we. What I'm asking about is what, what's going to affect uh, people's lives. You know, I think if you think that AGI is going to be having a transformative huge effect in 10 years, that, that seems like it's going to steal the show. Uh, if not, surely there's going to be something else that, that's called AI that is nevertheless making a profound difference. Um, you know, if you think that um, radiologists are all going to be out of the job in 10 years, you can say that, although I think uh, you're going to be arguing uphill after uh, what we just heard. So, so really, I want to think on the outcome, not so much on the technology we're able to do. Life will get you through. I hope so. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
I mean, it's fair to say the same thing. I think it's going to be boring 2% per year improvements in various things. That's <laughs> my prediction. For, 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 for all 10 years? Well, I mean, really? it's going to be compounded beyond. But it's going to be sort of slow and steady 2% per year improvements in performance. That is computer vision, but. Yeah, exactly. It's going to be time. <laughs> Uh, vision is all good. It's a detail if you talk about vision. Um, computer vision, is, I think that generally speaking, problems that involve a human taking an image or video, capturing that as a human, those problems will probably be solved. We are, we will get to the point that there will be some weird cases like the ones that you mentioned that will be a bit difficult, but generally speaking, things that people do in 10 years, human takes a photograph, things will be okay. Um, Robotics, where someone takes a robot and looks at the floor, we won't be able to know if that's the floor. I think those sorts of problems will still remain hard. Um, how will that affect your life? Again, yeah, again, some things will just get two percent easier per year, and that might cross some threshold where it then becomes meaningfully better for you. Okay, so Suzanne, you know, Greg is a graduate. Uh, you just founded a company that's uh, aiming to develop artificial gender intelligence on a venture capital finance horizon. Um, do you, do you agree? <laughs> well, I disagree with Greg. I partially disagree with Gary. Um, I think in the next 10 years, we are going to see, in the same way that deep learning suddenly became a thing, and then everyone started working on it, I think um, combining common sense reasoning with connectionist approaches is going to become a thing. So I think that there's going to be a lot of work done in that area, and there's going to be a lot of early gains to be had. So I work in field of robotics and applying AI to robots. I think once you start putting even the, the simplest parts of common sense reasoning into robots, you're going to get a massive leap forward in their capability. So I think what we're going to see is a vast improvement in the abilities of robots. And like robots, like the ones Mary showed in the video, they look so dumb. They look like they, you know, they kind of stand up and walk around and do things. <laughs> things. But I think the reason is because they don't have um, some of the symbolic AI and the common sense stuff put in them, and I think that's coming. Um, so the reason I partially disagree with Gary is I think um, you, you think like no one's working on it, or it's not, with like not enough people working on it, and I think there's going to be kind of um, a grand swell of that in the next thing. So it so happens that I'm writing an essay now called The Next Decade in AI, um, and I think we'll be done in about two weeks. And there's a section on hybrid models um, and the way that that second structure is basically to say there's a bunch of people um, who don't think we should be going after this. Most notably, Jeff Hinton, who has gone for CEU and said they're a waste of time. Um, they also said this um, to Bloomberg News that they wanted to turn anymore because someone said to Hinton, What do you think of Gary Marcus and his idea of hybrids? And he said it was ridiculous and obsolete and we should never do it. So there's some resistance from some well quarters, but there's actually a lot of people working on it. It's not anywhere near the number of people that are working on it. Um, pure deep learning, or that's even a thing. Um, but there certainly are plenty of people that are working on it. And I, I agree with you that progress there is what's going to change us from being a 2% year incremental thing, like Greg is describing. So it's not going to be 2% forever, right? There is eventually going to be an inflection point where we start seeing AI do really different things. Like package delivery to the door would be an example of something robots can eventually do. It'll really be game changing. Um, elder care robots that can really take care of people in their home and keep them in their home so they don't have to go to a, an elder care facility, um, that's going to be fundamentally game changing. It's not sort of a 2% a year away thing right now. It's not like incremental improvements in Roomba are going to get there. We're going to need you know, pretty profound changes to how we build robots before we can get to an elder care robot that can keep somebody in their home for an extra five years of their life. But it will happen, and I think. You know, I would agree with you that getting common sense in there is a big part of that. And then we're arguing about, is that a two-year project or a ten-year project? I think there's a bunch of people finally thinking seriously about that, maybe in the right ways, maybe not. Um, and it's hard to know, is that going to really take flight in the next five years, the next 25 years? It's a pretty hard problem. Nobody really has an answer to it yet, but maybe someone will figure it out. So I feel like you're all aiming pretty high in the answers that you gave here, right? I, really, what I'm, what I'm asking about is what, what's going to be fielded and you know, working in the world and mattering in people's lives over a pretty short time horizon, over kind of a decade, which means that 
probably this technology has kind of exist in a relatively that case is not that short. Can we challenge your premise? Mm -hmm. I mean, I, yeah, I just keep thinking it. about like the internet in 1994, Bill Gates writing the road ahead and like not mentioning the internet. Like, um, I mean, some of these technologies, once we get them at some scale, um, suddenly are transformative. And so well, I, I, I think that, that makes my point because the internet existed and worked well at that point. Right? It was really a social change. That it was a social change. That's true. Explosion. I don't know where we're going to be 10 years from now. I can say pretty confidently that promising a driverless car that goes from point A to point B, like an Uber, um, in the next three years, the way that, that you know, Elon Musk is promising, is not realistic. I can look at the problem, I can see the challenges of all the outlier cases and say there's nothing that's currently available that looks close to that. I can look and say, you know, the intervention rates, how often you need a human driver to intervene, are just nowhere near a human driver. It's just not going to be safe enough. And yes, probably in two or three years in Tel Aviv, um, because Amnon Shashua has so much influence over the um, Israeli government, there, there will probably be cars that can go on limited routes um, without a driver, but there'll be like no left turns and there'll be geofence, so it's only particular regions. It's not going to be here in three years. I think we can say that with confidence. But 10 years is a long time in the technological world. And I, I don't think we can be, say absolutely no. I think we can say not with current technology, but we can't say with what technology. Okay, well, I, I want to come back to our panel for a minute. And uh, I, I want to see whether anyone's willing to make affirmative predictions about <laughs> concrete technologies that you think are going to be making a difference to people over that kind of time horizon. Well, I think we'll see human-like robots walking around and, like Gary was saying, Caring, like caring for people in the home, maybe not, maybe not in people's individual homes, but in in kind of facilities and things like that. I think they'll actually be out there in something that's beyond prototype form, but not yet mass-produced form. Um, doing tasks, they won't be super smart yet. They won't be like beyond human-level intelligence, but I think they'll be able to do simple tasks. I think the hardware. Yeah, you can look at what's happening in new kinds of actuators, sensors, dexterous manipulators. I think if you if you track what's going on in the hardware, building a robot that's capable is not going to be that hard within a 10-year time frame. The costs are coming down. They'll come down even more once we get economies of scale and these things actually useful at doing things. So I think the hard problem is not in building the robot, it's in getting the AI to reason and think like a human. And I think there are going to be breakthroughs in that that will enable systems that are, that are coming out of the lab, coming out of prototype phase, and actually doing like beta testing in the real world of those things. So that's my approach. Cool. So, so Greg, what about you? Like these accrued 10%, 2%, uh, 2%, 2%, 2%, 2%, 2%, 2%, 2%, 2%, 2%, 2%, 2%, 2%, 2%, 2%, 2%, 2%, 2%, 2%, 2%, 2%, 2%, 2%, 2%, 2%, 
there are um, qualitative changes that come out of that. So like something like photo tagging was ridiculous in 2010, and now it works. Something like speech recognition was ridiculous in 2010, and now it's good enough. It is 2%, 2%, and then suddenly you're like one in 20 errors, and you're like, I can live with that. Okay, Frank, say something to get us excited. I'll put, I'll, put, I'll put a couple of things out there, why not, sure. Uh, <laughs> that's what you paid me here to be here for, right? Uh, okay. <laughs> uh, Macy or Barbie. <laughs> Can I get the EVO reword? Uh, so, no, I think, so uh, I'll, I'll say a couple of things. So, uh, I think in, in that period of time, one thing that won't be solved is, um, is the scheduling problem, like having two people actually automatically have a meeting selected by an agent. That's, that is the most NP uh, AI complete problem I know. It's just never going to get solved. No, no but I, I, I do think actually. Um, so I think in 10 years, we'll see a couple of things. Uh, one, I think that all of the AI ML, like the not AGI AI ML stuff, and this, this is something you have some experience with as well, I think that this, this bubble of, of highly trained people who know how to apply random forests or uh, various regression analyses or something like that, this employment demand is going to get killed. Those people are not going to be valuable, actually, I think. Basically, all of rote AI ML will be completely automated. There's, like, so sorry if you're studying AI ML, and you're going to have a job 10 years from now. They should go into radiology. <laughs> <laughs> I think radiology is a really, really good career. Right? But I think if you're at, the, at, 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 at a bank or at a consultancy or you're running a small company or whatever, I think that easily you've got, a, you've got some Excel spreadsheet, you want to predict column 17 from everything else. That thing is just going to be completely automated, and and this will be uh, transformative in the two percent kind of way, maybe the ten percent kind of way, the fifteen percent kind of way. But I think the demo the true democratization of of you know really statistical techniques, but what, what we call machine learning or AI, that I think will will be a solved problem in ten years. And many of the data scientist kind of jobs, those things, they're just not. So as threatening as that is for those of us sitting on the stage, <laughs> uh, what, what is that going to mean for the people in this room? Yeah. How is that going to, I mean, maybe some of the people in this room also are studying to be data scientists and are about to change their field to radiology. But what, what, what difference is it going to make for the average person who isn't you know, working at a university, working in a Well, I, I genuinely believe that things, that like everything gets better. I mean, obviously, the, the, one of the hallmark characteristics of of civilization is that things get more efficient and less costly and so on and so forth in general. Uh, and if uh, you know a mom and pop operator of a of a, uh, a, a dry cleaning company can order in supplies less frequently or more intelligently or predict demand more intelligently or something like that, and not have to pay an eighty thousand dollar consulting fee in order to get to that prediction, then, then just generally, I think. That the easiest prediction to make is that all of these technologies and, uh, of machine learning are going to spread throughout industry and lead to market efficiencies. But I think the critical thing that I would that I would put forward is that is that the inefficiency of having to pay an expert to do this for you, sorry, KPMG, uh, that that will that that will go away. I think. That, but so you know, look, um, the automobile was completely transformative. The cell phone was completely transformative. Um, the personal computer was completely transformative. There will be a point when we have domestic robots that will be completely transformative. Suzanne is much more optimistic than me and thinks we might have something a little like that in 10 years, and I think it might take longer, although I'm building a company that's trying to also trying to make, make it happen sooner. Um, what are the other things that are as transformative as that? So I think you're right about kind of auto ML driving out a lot of data science things, but that's not transformative of the world in the sense that Kevin is looking for, where like everybody's like, wow, I can't believe that back in 2020 they didn't have this technology the way that, you know, my kids, are, when they're old enough to understand what the internet is, they'd be like, how did you survive? Oh, uh, hey, I mean, we didn't pack a room in downtown, but we like, were automating data science, right? <laughs> what? Maybe we did. I think cars will be I think I think cars will be there in, in ten years. I think you can you know. So driverless cars, but they really can go from point A to point B, I think will be transformative. 
Yeah, I think, I think, I think. So, so when you guys think about employment, you know, that, I think there's, there's a lot of concern in, in the public, maybe in the room, about the, the potential impact of AI on uh, the, the economy of the future, on the job market. Um, you know, we've heard the radiologists are going to be fine, and that the data scientists should be in trouble. Uh, what about everybody else? It, should we expect to see large-scale changes? Um, it, Greg, it sounds like maybe you don't think so. I can speak to that a little bit. Human labor is actually not that expensive. It's actually really hard to come up with a competitive product for human labor um, on a unit economics perspective. So I've done a lot of analysis on this. What I think is going to happen, so it, it's, it's hard to get to that price point of it actually being competitive with labor if you're talking, at least if you're talking about physical labor, which I, I'm often thinking about. It's a different matter if you're talking about automating things that can be done with someone sat behind a computer, but I'm thinking about physical tasks, something where you actually need a body to go out there in the world and do something. So the, the price point is tricky to, to get to, and also the dealing with the social issues of that very hard. So what I think we're actually going to see is the initial use cases will be robots going out there and doing things where there are actually labor shortages, or where there are looming problems like the demographic crisis, there's an inverting population pyramid, and it turns out in the future there just aren't going to be enough people to look after uh, an aging population and more and more people will be caring and there'll be less people to actually do jobs like firefighting and teaching and all these kind of things. So I, I think we'll actually need um, robots and AI systems to do a lot of work in the future just from projecting out what's going to happen with population um, statistics in the future. And so this is going to require like a weird mind shift from everyone, but it, it's going to become pretty obvious soon that there will be labor shortages in areas, and I think that'll be the places where these systems start going into first. I think it depends a bit on the time scale that you're talking, time horizon that you're talking about. I think in the next decade, there are a couple of things that will be a lot more automated. So um, it also depends on how many employees you have. So if you're Walmart or you're McDonald's, then there are parts of the doing that can be automated, and you can afford to make large investments in order to do it. Um, if you're a small grocery store, you're probably not going to be robotized in the next 10 years. There might be robots playing some role, but you know, there's still going to be a reasonable number um, of, of people working in, in a place like that. If you're talking about 100 years, then a lot of the problems that we're worrying about now, like how do you deal with outlier cases and common sense and stuff, those things will be solved. In 100 years, we're not going to have anywhere near as many jobs, I think, um, as we currently do. In 10 years, Maybe driver will be an occupation that disappears, and maybe that's 20 years. Fast food worker might disappear relatively quickly. Um, radiologist is not that going to disappear um, all that quickly. Um, anything that requires a real natural language understanding is not going to disappear soon. So, you know, you can have AI systems that will search legal documents for keywords, but you can't have AI systems that actually understand a court case. Um, we're not anywhere near close to that. So a lot depends on the nature of the particular job. I think what we're often finding is that it's easy to replace a function of a job, but hard to replace a job. So radiology, the reason we're not replacing radiologists is because there's a piece of what radiologists do, the deep learning, at least if it can't do today, it will be able to do very soon. But radiologists do a lot of things, like they take biopsies sometimes, depending on where they are. And, you know, just because you have a deep learning algorithm doesn't mean you can take a biopsy. And part of radiology is reading about the patient's history. AI systems are not very good at reading. So if it's just about the image recognition, then sure. There are lots of jobs that have some image recognition component that you can farm out to a machine, and then you have to think about the economics. So you know, it might not be worth it to have a machine do this piece of radiology because you still need the radiologist anyway. Or maybe you'll be able to have your radiologist be twice as productive until it's worth it. By the thing. But there aren't that many jobs where 100% of what um, is done now can be replaced. And even in a place like Walmart, the way that they're going to be able to do it is they have 100 employees and they can cut that down to seven or something like that. So they'll get rid of a lot of positions, but there's some things they still can't do for a while. It's kind of funny how I loved it. Um, one of the original sources of pure over, over job loss related to AI is a paper that was published uh, at co authored by a former <coughs> Machine learning techniques 
to extrapolate from uh, the past into the future, uh, which we all know is an invalid thing to do. Uh, and in fact, um, several follow-on PhD students who uh, re replicated the same study and attempted to, to sort of make a statistical statement about job loss due to automation um, were unable to progress in their degree because the very machine learning technique used to make these predictions was not valid. So uh, I it, actually it could be you left Oxford. Uh, yeah, yeah, to well, a sort of intellectual sincerity is, is uh, yeah uh, rewarded. No, uh, I, I I think I, I I don't think much is automated away. I, I think that, and, and additionally the market will work. I mean, we're, we're really talking about the there's always some marginal cost for labor. Right? So people can do something. Do you think? Do you guys think even 100 years from now there won't be changes, or are we just talking about 10? I think there'll be drastic changes. Yeah. 100 years, for sure. So we're actually pretty aligned. We none of us think that much will happen in 10 years. We all think a lot will. Happen. I think I think what's going to happen in the rest of the I don't think I ever be the most bullish person in the I don't know what's going to happen. There's a lot of stuff that's going to happen. We're going to have to test the time. We're going to have to test the time. Kevin, tell us about it. I think a lot of stuff is going to happen. I'm kind of looking at it. Tell us what? Yeah, I mean, Gary's going to be finally have something to prepare. I think you're always scared of Gary. I'm scared of Gary. But uh, no, I, I think that uh, you guys are really focusing on you know, robotics, physical embodied applications. I think because what? Well, but yeah, you know, I can see why you would be right. But I'm with Greg that the it, you know, virtual kind of knowledge manipulation tasks are um, way easier to make quick progress on. I think we're, we're going to see a lot more happening there um, in the short term. For example. Yeah, yeah. I'm mean, myself on here. I wasn't even expecting to do this. But, um, I think we're going to see, um, yeah, I, I think, you know, Gary, many of your points are, are well made, but I think you're focused on the negative. I think you, you identified various things that you know, deep learning in particular won't be able to do, but I think deep learning isn't all of AI, as you pointed out yourself. I think lots of progress is getting made in those other areas of AI. Um, I think, you know, hybrid models are, you know, for, Incredibly mainstream thing that a lot of the rest of AI is thinking about. It. I think a lot of progress is getting made in bringing in new kinds of you know, structured knowledge into AI systems. I think a lot is happening in natural language right now. I, you're right. I, I think we're not going to see you know, deep textual understanding, you know, deep textual synthesis, but I think there's a chasm between what computers can do with language today and deep understanding. I think there's a huge scope for us to interact with computers in a more natural, organic way. I don't think you can get that deep understanding without robots or embodiment. So I didn't even have to go there anyway. Why don't you tell us more about that piece? You were mentioning that to me before. Yeah, well, I think like the common sense reasoning stuff, what we consider common sense reasoning is everything that humans care about. So, you know, we, we like, we consider this to be an important object because we can bring water from it, etc., etc. Um, the kind of way that you're going to get AI to learn about concepts like that is by putting them into robots that navigate the world in the same way we do, interact with objects in the same way we do, and have similar goals to us. I think, now I think you can build systems that have symbolic concept understanding, but I don't think they'll be able to converse with us using natural language, because natural language is designed for humans to talk about concepts that humans understand through their um, sensory motor system for goals that humans care about. <coughs> so this is why I work on human-like robots, because I think it's the best way to get a map, a match, between AI talking the same language that we are talking, and I mean that like figuratively and literally. So that's, I just, I think you're gonna keep grinding away at the, these text models and, and, and kind of keep like getting incremental, incremental process, but there won't be a, a breakthrough in true understanding and true conversational ability with an AI until it actually has a way of imagining the world in the same way that we do. So I think you need, you need robots, or at the very least, very high fidelity simulations of robots. And even then, I don't think that works because you can't simulate other people in those environments. And I think pe being able to simulate the interactions with other people would be really key. You look skeptical, Frank. Right? 
in a way, I understand make some more provocative statements about what I added to the menu. Oh, you haven't made one yet, I think. All right. <laughs> I know, I mean, I'll make one. I agree on that. All right, I think uh, in time you have spoken about policing and defense. I think um, it's going to be a lot of surveillance. There's going to be a ton of surveillance. Sure. I think that is going to change the life of the average person living in the city. I mean, that's already happened. happens. We're going to be awesome. We're terrible. Will it change the average life, though? I mean, we're already being surveilled through our phones, through seats, through cameras, through, through banks. Like, I think you know, every since the beginning of the beginning, I think I think right now a lot of that data is being collected, but I think society as a whole has to reckon with the implications of that. I think that's that's going to be a big story. But that's a social things. thing, not a. I mean, I mean, the AI for that actually already exists. It will get better, move better in various but ways. My problem for you was how is AI going to be changing the world, the, the lives of people you know, living in the city in the next ten years? I think but those I mean, technologies are going to be making changes in people's lives. I mean, that kind of thing is happening in China already. Sure. So, so that's, it, I mean, there's a question about how much more will be adopted, let's say, in Vancouver or Milwaukee or, or whatever. But that's not a new technology. It's a, it will get better in the sense that, like, an AI system will better be able to tell, did the person who walked into the building two hours ago, is that the same as the person who just walked out now? It will be better kind of reasoning and inference about that, um, better in the sense of more reliable, not in the sense of moral. Um, so there'll be some changes there. We already live, as as Ben is saying, in a world where Facebook and the banks and, and so forth and so on um, are collecting an enormous amount of data. People aren't reckoning with that, but that's already here. I, I mean, I think um, it, I'm not. A fan. I, I think one can can dismiss a lot of arguments by saying either in some form that's already here, or it's not going to happen for a long time. We were only on question one. I, I think but you may start answering questions two, three, and four in response to so, question one, so, so I just threw out the script. So here's <laughs> a, a way of thinking about question one is like, what thing will we have in 2030 that like people in 2020 will be like, wow, that's really different. So cell phones seem pretty different to like how I thought about the world growing up in the 70s when like, okay, they existed, they were car phones, few really wealthy people have the, the notion that everybody would have a cell phone all the time. That was like Dick Tracy, there was a cartoon about it, but I didn't, you know, I didn't foresee that it was going to be as widespread as it is. Um, I kind of feel like driverless cars will be like that eventually. I don't quite think it's going to be in the next decade, but next two or three, yes. Um, I don't know that the next 10 years are going to have a lot of inventions like that. I mean, that's kind of what Greg is saying. Like, There'll be a lot of improvements to a lot of things that we already know. Photo tagging will get better. Speech recognition will get more reliable. Is there some like you know killer app that's going to come out in 2029 that we're not anticipating? There could be. I think the U.S. these things are 80 percent accuracy today. And think about if they were that in 1995, will that change my life? Think you know, things like translation, real-time translation systems, they change my life. There's a good depth of that. It'd be amazing to travel to foreign countries and you can't speak language. While we're on the subject of, of percentage, um, driverless cars are interesting because like getting one percent better each year isn't quite enough. So driverless cars really have to get like ninety-nine point nine 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 people say like five nines of accuracy. And so small incremental improvements for a while won't really matter because you won't really be able to use them because they won't be safe for the people. <coughs> you won't want to do it. Whereas translation, you know, at percent each year is, is gonna have a, a real deal and the Cost of error most of the time is not so high, um, so that also kind of enters into the calculus. Like, what is when can you get a qualitative change from a quantitative change? I touched on that before. Like speech recognition, it's kind of like if it's eighty percent correct, it's just useless to you. You're correcting so many things. If it's ninety-two percent, it's not great. That's just good enough that it's helpful. I and mean, there are all these problems. I think in the virtual world again, where humans don't generally live there. So you think about monitoring financial transactions at large scale. Humans just can't really do that. So systems that, that are AI systems that learn how to do that will be quite good. And that will be transformative because right now humans aren't able to really make sense of all those transactions. Do you think fraud's going to disappear? I, I was thinking of it as like cat and mouse part, thing. Right? You're about social part of that. But you're saying like, if there's something you want to glean from those data, you will be able to do it. It will reach some error measure where, OK, that's, that's how you use it. Um, you know, maybe it's things like smart homes um, sensor data that are your homes. Again, hard for humans to make sense of, but we can probably understand why we just do that. 
those sorts of things are, are likely to be transformed. I think a, a, I mean, I think a killer app is a really hard thing to look for. I think a, a, you know, deployed technology that's starting to have a lot of effects, I think it's much easier to think about. But in my mind, maybe the best candidate for a killer app is person-to-person -person social interaction. Now, I think we're going to look back at Twitter and Facebook as being unbelievably primitive. That they're essentially broadcast platforms with a little bit of sort of personalized curation on, on the sort of tail end. But I think it would be much more interactive. You know, if I'm sort of thinking, I've got half an hour to kill and I'd love to hang out with some of my friends, and I'd like some kind of curated real time interaction with real people who might not be geographically in the same place as me. You know, all of the building blocks for that exist today. You have enough enemies on Twitter, as I do. It's already like that. <laughs> I post something, and within like seven minutes, there's 12 replies from around the world criticizing everything I said. Yeah, but that's all your social interactions have to be you know, critical Twitter fights about AI. What, what if you just want to get together with people about you know, a particular different topic or I actually think what we will have is we'll, we'll actually have companion apps to do that. So the these systems that try and have common sense understanding and stuff, you can train them on simulations or robots in the real world. But once you train them, you can deploy them like at scale in an app. So I actually think within 10 years, we'll have something like, her, if you've seen the movie Her, some kind of AI companion thing that knows you really, really well. It knows everything about you. It can like talk to you. It can cheer you up. It can talk about whatever you want to talk about, sports, cooking, like anything. And I think that will that will actually be kind of a, a bit of a killer app that comes along. I mean, Chalice in China already is. Yes. Yeah. Right? yeah. So there are already systems that, that are kind of you know how many users does that have? It, it has really? many, millions, many, many, many. millions of users, and it's like a chatbot. So I think we're going to see smarter and smarter chatbots that are using some of this common sense reasoning, some of this understanding of the physical world to ground knowledge, being deployed on mobile devices. You can make it look like whatever you want. It's like you are your personal friend. I think that's, that's coming. Here's a question just for the three of you. I think we, we, we heard Gary give an answer to this already, uh, although I guess I'll invite him to reflect at the end. But um, what, if anything, do you think the general public really misunderstands about AI and needs, needs to understand? Frank, you want to wait in? Well, I mean, I think. Uh, <laughs>
and that generally machine learning is about a training set of pairs x i and y i, and if the new sample points are outside of that, it is bad. That's sort of that that that's I think Gary sort of you know, Gary said that. Do you think that statement is clear enough to the general public? Yeah. So you know, Gary, <laughs> the, 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 the x i y i probably helps a lot. I know. <laughs> <laughs> the, 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 the i equals one. <laughs> That, that fact, I think, is, it needs to be, it's really important. I think people don't understand that. And if you go beyond that distribution, you're in trouble. Yeah. Uh, I think the biggest misconception in AI is that the kind of AI people should be scared of is the Terminator killer robots going to come and take their jobs and or worse, you know, that kind of thing, attack them military robots and drones, but the kind of AI we should be worried about is the kind of AI you can't see that's operating in the background and algorithms that are subtly manipulating you and changing the way you act on a day-to-day -day basis without you knowing. So I think that's like the biggest misconception is we've all been sold this sci-fi dystopian narratives of like robots coming and banging down our doors and then like, you know, doing us harm when there are other ways in which AI can do extremely manipulative things to large groups of people that Facebook for example. Good point. So, so it seems like um, you, you guys, I, I, I think personally, very much agree with that. Um, I think the, I, you know, this notion that the Terminator is going to come for me and then take my job. And in fact, what, what is it's, it's worse than that. It's, it's probably the opposite. Like the robots would probably actually be the most helpful, useful things to us. And the other kind of AI is like bad for us, like hooking, like marketing to us, manipulating us, addicting us. So, so you know, we do have this uh, tenure focus in the name of this event, but uh, which isn't on the screen, but yeah, there it is the screen. But uh, yeah, nevertheless, you, you guys, uh, as a group, should be fired up with that AGM. So, so let's end by, by thinking on a, a longer time scale. So you know, AGI, artificial general intelligence, um, how should we feel about this prospect? Is this something we should welcome? Is this something we should regulate? You know, should we? Lock up scientists and report to work on this to be a danger for society. Um, you know, how, should, how should the public feel about the, the prospect of you know, a bunch of scientists trying to create computers that are as intelligent as people are, are working on? Well, humans do it. Humans do it. They try and create things that are more intelligent than them. I mean, that's why I have kids, right? <laughs> <laughs> majority of humans are, a specific group of humans want. So I think this idea of AGI becoming super smart and then you know wiping us all out or somehow becoming misaligned with us is not a problem with the AI in and of itself. It's a problem with designing the goals, which is a little bit of a different question. I mean, it tends to still be put on the AI scientists to do that, but I just wanted to like make sure people were aware of that distinction. Yeah, and Greg, I think we've heard the least about your thoughts about AGI. What do you think about this kind of I feel that it's not really what people are working on in AI, to be honest. I just don't really feel like it's the best thing they're working on. I, I, this, I mean, maybe it comes too late to be controversial like this. This does <laughs> bring, this does bring <laughs> it's up. People are writing nerds papers about things that are going to make us slightly better at solving some specific small task. And I think that. That's because they don't have the AGI But they're, they don't exist. Like, there's not like this, this thing that's really going to generally solve it. Other than you could say that um, you know, 
stochastic gradient descent is our AGL. Well, this like say, what about cognitive architecture design and things like that? Like, you don't see a lot of that at the main ML conferences, but it is a thing. What, what, what work is it that's actually solving these like, general problems? Right? It seems so impossible to think that that's what we're going to do. It's wait, so wait a second. Different. I mean, very few people are working on it now. I think Suzanne can characterize herself that way, frankly. Um, in general, most of the field I don't think is, but there's no reason to think that it's impossible to build general intelligence, as Suzanne has already pointed out. We have one way of doing that, which is through biological reproduction. There's no reason um, to think that we can't have better systems. We're, I think, missing some fundamental ideas, and I think there's some old ideas that aren't taken seriously enough, like having large-scale common sense knowledge databases that might be prerequisite for doing it, but I, I don't see it as impossible. I just don't, don't see any of those ever in this fifth generation project all over. I mean, I, I think that recycling these old ideas from the past and saying that, well, that now it's artificial general intelligence because we're using virtual logic. I mean, I'm not saying we have it now. I'm well, you could use the same argument about people trying to build airplane flying machines for like hundreds and hundreds of years and then, oh, all of a sudden the right pieces came together. At the right yeah, time. Or, or deep learning was kind of useless until yeah. 2010. It was useful in 2009. <laughs> 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 and in 2009, like, you know, he didn't leave a poster, nobody went to his post. Yeah, Y'all could have had a little toy airplane into the camera in 2006. Mm -hmm. Yeah, people laughed at it and they said, well, yeah, that's nice, but I'll go build an SVM instead. I mean, it, it certainly didn't have any yeah, let's, let's turn this around. So, uh, more, of our, more of our, our friends, Zub and Germani, yeah. had a, gave, a, gave a talk recently at a controversial talk, which if we weren't focused on the tenure thing, I would, I would put out there, uh, uh, which says, after, so here's, a, here's the converse to your, to your, to your statement, and I think it's really depressing that you de com conflate acceptance of economy. I, mean, I have students in the audience, they're like, oh my god, you have to, you have to do boring ML to get a Durham's paper. That's, 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 it's, it's kind of true, that's sociological, though. But I'll let my students talk about you for one second and say, okay, what, uh, so, uh, so, a Zoom talk, which is a talk that I thought about giving myself, is that we have all the ingredients, right? Like, uh, what sort of thing, you know, we have reinforcement learning, right? so we don't know, we don't understand purpose. We have reinforcement learning, we have, uh, we have program induction in the form of deep learning that can basically, you know, write code that's better than humans can write. We have probabilistic inference, we have, you know, knowledge bases, we have, like, we have all these things, that, in fact, there are even, you know, people who work on techniques and technologies that actually make it possible to program all the stuff in one unified framework. Uh, okay. Uh, so we've got all this stuff. What are we missing? So besides figuring out how to put it together in the right way, like what <coughs> fundamental thing are we missing? You know, it's sort of like, you know, deep learning is the same kind of thing. Like, you know, what are, we, what are we missing? We just need to figure out the architecture. Like, you know, we're probably missing the fact that the problem space is too big to be to, to find a solution that can talk and have a reasonable conversation. Yeah. But great, humans do this all the time. I mean, not perfectly, and, but you know, it's not uncommon for someone to go to college and use what they have learned up to that point and get very good at some particular thing um, using a form of general intelligence. I actually had a conversation with Zubin also recently, and, and he made the point that um, human intelligence isn't like fully general. There are lots of things that humans can't learn, but it's still astonishing how many things you can take a bright undergraduate and teach them how to do, and that they can become at least you know reasonably qualified professionals in, in many many different fields. So the human brain is an existence group of some degree of generality. It's not perfectly general. So you can't teach every person to be a chess grandmaster. You could probably teach any person to be a chess master if you really worked on it, spent enough. Um, and certainly you could teach anybody to play pretty good chess in you know, relatively small amount of time. Or anything else, you can teach them to drive, you can teach them to write stories or articles, whatever. And yes, there's some talent differences between different people and so forth. But human minds are remarkably general. I mean, my seven-year-old can do many, many different things, way more than current software can do. Like, I don't see why we couldn't, in principle, get software to be as versatile as myself. I'm not sure about that my region, but the existence of your seven-year-old and then software. Well, so why? I mean, you know, dig in and tell, tell me the truth. 
I mean, do you think that intelligence is not actually, you know, physically embodied? In which case, I would see your argument that I don't buy that premise. I, I just feel that the, the way in which we currently go about um, building AI systems is not um, trending toward that type of thing. That I completely agree with. So I don't think we're on the right path. But I don't think that the fact that we're not on the right path precludes things. I mean, it'd be like, you had the, Suzanne had the example of airplanes look kind of hopeless 200 some years ago, because um, none of the paths that were being pursued were the right ones. Or you could look at how we were understanding the biological basis of inheritance in 1850 or 1870. Right? Mendel said, hey, there are these factors, and everybody went around thinking that the factors were proteins. It was the wrong path, but didn't mean that we couldn't find it. So that's why I'm not optimistic in 100 years of innovation, because I just don't think we're even close to having those right principles. And then the current hype and excitement and successes are really not like what we're talking about. I mean, that I completely agree with. I mean, that was the force of the talk. The thing that we have now is just a small part of the answer. I completely agree with you there. Okay, I, I let this go a little long because the, the panel was in deep disagreement, but they look like they're converging and agreeing again. <laughs> <laughs> again, that's that. Well, let's get that in the bud. Uh, instead, I'm going to turn it over to all of you. Uh, so, so now is the time when you know, we invite you know, any of you who might have uh, questions for the panel to, to step up to uh, one of the two microphones we have there. We'll uh, alternate back and forth, um, and uh, we'll spend uh, 20 minutes uh, doing it in fun with you guys. So, so don't be shy. Uh, let's begin with our first mover over here. That was a great talk, guys. Thank you for being here. Um, I'm interested in hearing a bit more about the ethics of AI and developing a, um, a general intelligence. And like an example that I could give is that it has the potential for a huge disruption. Um, and you could draw a parallel to developing like a nuclear bomb and how that was sort of like a very like powerful force, but also in the wrong hands it could be a very negative thing, right? Interested in hearing your thoughts. So, so the ethics of taking pictures of your daughter while she's getting stuck in your chair? Uh, I don't think that was what the question was. Um, I, I think that there are profound questions around getting genuinely intelligent agents to behave in ethical kinds of ways um, that we're not remotely prepared to address yet. Um, the way I think about it is, People talk about Asimov's laws, which start with basically what don't do harm to people. Um, that you know you can quibble about it, right? Asimov's stories were all about when these his three basic laws were in conflict with one another and exceptions and so forth. The real problem is we don't yet know how to program the notion of harm into a machine. So there are some subtleties to worry about, and I was responsible for foisting trolley problems into driverless cars. So what happens? when driving this car uh, sees a school bus spinning out of control and stuff like that. And we can talk about those cases, but the real basic cases that we're gonna need like a domestic robot to be able to deal with aren't like these profound ethical dilemmas. They're just like, how do I know if you know knocking over the candlestick is likely to cause harm to people, right? It's not exactly an ethical question, but it is a question of prior question to being able to do the ethical computation is to figure out would the consequence of this action be um, to cause harm to human beings. And right now we don't have to do that. So the paradigm that Greg and I, I think in particular, are critical of, probably all we all are, is like we label a bunch of things. And that works well with pictures. So I can label a glass and a picture, and um, you know, it's easy to get someone to give me the data, and more glasses will look mostly like these glasses. The harm is a very complicated, abstract kind of thing. So we can't just label images in order to teach machines what harm is. And, Probably to do that, we need some of the common sense that Suzanne and I have been harping on. Or to understand, like, causing pain, first of all, can be physical or emotional, and there are all these different ways you can cause emotional pain to other people. So sometimes it could be good. Like, sometimes it could be good. You need to give someone that. Give a quick shot of the art back to that suggestion. Um, I, I have other things, but I'm not going to go there. Um, <laughs> So, just to wrap it up, so we don't yet have 
a kind of intelligence where we can, for example, put symbolic information. So a lot of our understanding of, of harm, for example, comes from either like court cases or hypotheticals or we watch stories and we decide that the thing that we saw in this movie, what this character did was a reasonable thing because it had this consequence for the greater good and so forth. The software we have right now can't absorb that kind of stuff. And that's a prerequisite, I think, to getting to ethical AI. On the other hand, given how limited the AI is right now, we don't have that word. The worry that we do have is mostly about things like loans and, and um, giving people um, job interviews and stuff like that, which is a different set of ethical issues, which is more like how do you teach a system to not have certain kinds of human biases through proxy? And the systems do that a lot. I don't know if anyone else wants to rip on that or I can. But so that's a different level of, of ethics, which is like how do you teach a, a system to not discriminate on gender when you're uh, screening computer software programmers. So historically, for example, there's a statistical correlation that most computer programmers don't ha have ballet on their resume. But that doesn't mean that just because that was historically the case that we want that to continue to be the case. We don't want to protect, perpetuate a historical bias that kept women out of the programming by picking up on this statistical correlation that's historical but not causal. And so that's a huge ethical problem that we also can't really solve without having more sophisticated AI. So let's quickly touch in on the rest of our panel before we go to the next question. Any, any concrete ethical issues that we should be concerned about with AI? Is, is AI you know, the next nuclear weapon? Is, is ethics not the foremost thing we should be worried about right now? Maybe a sentence or two of each. Well, one of, the, one of the reasons I like work on human-like AI and human-like robots is you can actually kind of put in some of these things that Gary was talking about, like. You want to design your, your system so it's as human-like as possible. So you basically want to design it so it has the same kind of ethics as human. It understands what things like pain are, what things like harm are, and what, um, I mean, it understands those things very specifically. And I think uh, that's another good reason for making something as close as possible to humans. They will not only inherit our values and our goals and our understanding, they will also inherit our ethics. And then it becomes a thousand-year-old question of what's the right ethics humans, and it kind of takes AI out of the Briefly, I just say I'm optimistic in this domain. I think that humans have biases and prejudices, and I think I'm more optimistic about <coughs> systems that some of those good things. I don't know, I'll say at the level of AGI, the, the, the question of breakdown, I, I think it's actually really more of a human question than it is uh, anything else. Right? Um, I, I would uh, uh, say It's going to have a judgment kind of pleasure on what the, the time frame is, you know, 500 years, or your days. Three, or you go bust. Somewhere in between. Yeah. Somewhere in between, it's likely to happen, right? And I, I think that, uh, um, uh, you know, you can be very technical about this, but the, 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 the value function or reward shaping or whatever that, that, that this, this, this agent is developed with is something that we would like to have share share our, uh, our, our, our opinion, whatever neutral idea about what's possible, right? Uh, so I think kind of give a little visual thing to one thing to be able to do it in this way versus the way somebody else would think. I'm going to say something that I feel like it's I think that you know, before we worry about AI having malicious intentions towards us, I think we're going to be worried about governments using AI with malicious intentions upon us. No, it's more of a That we should be worried about now. Yeah, that is, that's happening right now. Yeah. Right, let's get to the next question. Thank you for all the discussion. Um, it seems like the discussion is focused on AI as a sweet system, something that we engineer, and it, it builds up to AGI. I was interested in your uh, opinions or thoughts about uh, hybrid systems. So uh, AI that is integrated with human intelligence rather than as a discrete system. Uh, two examples, I know that there are companies that are, instead of tagging and uh, looking at data as kind of a flattened kind of tagged examples, um, they're looking at EEG signals and are trying to kind of merge uh, human intelligence, biological intelligence with uh, with what we do in, in the AI field. So that's like one option that I'm interested to, to understand your opinions on, like hybrid um, intelligence or that. 
And the other is, if, if we're governed by the Facebook feed that is used by AI, and we view this, if you, and we view the system as we blast the uh, feed, are we at AGI point, or what is, like, how is that going forward if we, if we include the human within that, that system? There's a lot there, but in the interest of getting to more than one or two more questions, let's just try to respond briefly. And who's, who, who on the panel? I, I can say something about that. So one of the things that uh, we do at Sanctuary in our curious company is we actually have an immersive teleoperation of humanoid robots by human pilots. And this is kind of cool because you can have, instead of um, a job being taken by a robot, you can actually have a human in the loop who's being augmented by all those AI feeds and all that extra information, helping them do a job better. So that's a fun example where you've got this interesting um, combination of like the human with the common sense understanding today and the ability to dexterously control the robot with all this like extra information and deep learning and, and the other kinds of AI feeding into all of that human. So that's kind of cool. I think in the far future you might think about some of these brain interfaces, but I think that's going to be further, way further out than our 10 year timeline. But I think it is. Maybe uh, we'll move on to the next question. Yeah. Oh, yeah. We've got people on the other microphone now. I, I, was, I think that was nice. Um, yeah, I, I think I'd like to take the next question because I think it aligns with the previous question. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. I, I found a theme in this, uh, in this presentation today. It was uh, about rebranding. And every time and again, we have been rebranding. AI has become a machine learning, has become deep learning, has become artificial general intelligence, which to me looks like reinforcement learning is AGI in this context here. Um, and we also talked about airplanes, uh, which was really hard to build for quite some time when people are trying to mimic, mimic flying birds with the added dexterity in, in their degree of freedom of movement. Uh, what my question is, uh, talking about robots, it looks like uh, for each degree of freedom that we add in our machines, it's going to be super complicated to actually realize that in the real world. Like, for example, uh, planes have more or less degree of freedom than a bird has in terms of uh, wings. Uh, my question is, uh, can you talk about the unit economics of added degree of dexterity or freedom in robots or artificial intelligence in general? <coughs> I think Sanctuary AI personal would be best suited to answer this question. That's a pretty technical question. Does any of you uh, want to go there? Well, it is true that increasing the number of degrees of freedom in a robot makes the low-level control harder, but th that's not all there is. There's like multiple layers of control in a cognitive architecture. So what you're trying to do with a complex system like a robot, and in fact, the only way you can use something like reinforcement learning in these systems is to is to create layers of abstraction so you compress down the either perception or action space into something that's small enough that you can then <coughs> read over or learn over. So the bird, the bird example, sure a bird's wing can move in many more ways than a plane's wing, but when they're flying, they tend to do one movement. So you can think of that as a higher level action command. And so I think, yes, adding more degrees of freedom makes your hierarchy more complex, but it doesn't necessarily make the, the learning part more if you've, if you've constructed that hierarchy correctly. Uh, that sounds like yeah, a Gary should comment on this as well. I'll say something much more general, but it's on the same point, which is um, I don't think any of us thinks that the route to artificial general intelligence, however long it takes, is going to be replicating a human. But I think that we all think, um, certainly I think, that um, we can learn some things from humans. So there's some things that humans do abysmally that we don't want to borrow. So the humans are terrible at short-term memory, for example. They're terrible at arithmetic for anything more than a couple of digits. They're pretty bad at searching long, complicated trees. So lots of things, people are terrible, we, we wouldn't want to copy. But there are some things that humans are intriguingly good at, um, which include natural language understanding and reasoning flexibly in a complex world. And we may ultimately not replicate how people do that, but since they're the only known systems that can do certain things, it, it makes sense to try to understand those principles and see if we can learn anything from them. Let's see if we can get through the rest of our questions in the time we have. Yeah. Okay, great. So uh, I'll ask a 
question that occurs to us is, I think, in non-anthropocentric terms. I know that artificial intelligence as a discipline is very much dedicated to really replicating the performance of the human brain. But I'd like to ask your opinion about the potential of, let's say, joint uh, biological computational approaches that are seeking to really study the algorithmic processes or structures that we might see at the molecular or cellular level and inform AI. I think this links to something Suzanne might, might be working on with your um, referral to, your reference to the concept of embodiment. I also briefly want to answer Kevin's question about major advances in the next decade. Speaking from the perspective of environmental science, which I know is outside the purview of conventional concerns of, of um, computer science, I see enormous change coming. Many of the most insoluble problems in environmental science, the paucity of data, the post hoc regulation, all, many of these are going to be solved by the machine learning techniques that are already available today. So I see already enormous advances in predictive hazard management, conservation, and even some very intriguing developments with respect to things like computational sustainability, ecological informatics, and eco-semiotics. For example, digital bioacoustics as a field would not exist without the sorts of techniques that are emerging from computer science. The implications are largely outside the human economy as we know it, but I think they're transformative. So I wanted to inject a little hopeful note um, into the conversation, because I think some of the biggest impacts are going to be, again, outside the purview of of the conventional concerns of computer science, but be, be very impactful nonetheless. Glad to hear something hopeful from somebody. <laughs> <laughs> Does anyone on the panel uh, want to respond to that? I, I can. I can take the first part of this off. Let's go, go ahead go and say something. Um, there, there. The very well first part. Uh, and I'll, I'll call out to a, a, a furry young man sitting back there again. Yeah. Uh, so there's been a rich interplay between neuroscience in particular and, and, and machine learning. Uh, a lot of it is relatively fabricated, like post hoc storytelling about what neural networks do with these sorts of things. Um, but uh, I, I can comment not on, say, for instance, neuromotor computers or something like that, that I don't know nothing about it and somewhat unusual things. But uh, there are there are those of us who, say, for instance, use machine learning techniques to try to actually learn about how biological systems compute. Uh, uh, in the case of, of, of Andy, we use probabilistic programming techniques. We didn't talk about that today, it doesn't really matter. Uh, we use sophisticated probabilistic machine learning techniques to attempt to actually infer what the specific update rules for synaptic strengths are in a simulator of C. elegans, uh, a very, very biologically reasonable at the chemical, you know, uh, very sophisticated thing, but believe it that. Uh, uh, and with that, we hope to be back into modern machine learning. We haven't talked about like, energy usage, which is dumb the way machine learning is done right now. It's horrible. We should see major changes there. And yeah, we've talked about lifelong learning, which more or less doesn't exist uh, in, in machine learning AI systems right now, which is a terrible travesty. Uh, but biological systems have these capabilities, and one of the best things you can do is either in vitro, in silico, or in vivo, look at these processes and try to understand them using the tools of probabilistic and machine learning. I don't know if that actually answers your first question or not, but for the address to it, hopefully. Uh, at least I got to talk about something I want to talk about. We call out more questions. <laughs> <laughs> we've got about five minutes left and two people waiting for the microphones. I think if we're really quick, we can, we can hear from each of you. Uh, I, uh, I, I will leave it to, to the two of you to decide who is the next one. Uh, oh, maybe we don't, okay. Um, mysteriously, two people said that, okay. <laughs> Go ahead. So there is a lot of uh, progress made in AI to develop uh, music and text, uh, educating voice of someone else. Uh, it's a problem that I see happening, especially in Brazil, in my home country, during the elections there. Where there was a lot of misinformation with Facebook and a lot of spread of fake news. And this is happening across the world. Um, my fear is when we're talking about the future and the impact of the AI is generating voice or very realistic images or even videos of politics or, or something that. I'm, okay, okay. It's already hard for me to convince my grandma that that picture is a Photoshop, but it will be even harder to convince that that's important. I think 
think our robot overlords are asking that you finish your question. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, anyway, uh, oh, sorry, sorry. Uh, you have any thoughts about the uh, spread of fake news and the uh, responsibility of AI in that topic? I think uh, AI has been terrible for the spread of misinformation um, in two ways. So news feeds uh, actually, be because um, companies like Facebook get paid by the click, they, it's in their interest to give you things that you click on, and it's in human psychology's interest to find things that agree with you and things that make you really angry at other people. Right now in the United States, no, I'm not going to go there, but, um, <laughs> but um, uh, it makes it such that, that news feeds tend to promote misinformation um, more than other things. They're optimized to make money, misinformation is a good way to do it. And then we have the problem that you're referring to of, of fake videos and, and so forth. And those are just going to get better and better and better. Um, I like to sometimes show a graph where I show natural language understanding really hasn't improved in 40 or 50 years. We really can't do it very well. But the quality of synthetic images has gone up exponentially, super exponentially, um, you know, over the last seven years. That's just going to get better and better. Um, again, the quotes aren't good at it. Um, there's going to be more and more fake videos that's going to be impossible to tell uh, from authentic videos. So, so I think we're, we're going to have to leave it there. Let me just, uh, uh, he's already asked a question tonight. I think, uh, I think we're, uh, we're, we're, we're at one professor. We're going to have to leave it at one question person. But, uh, but, but let me give Gary a, a last chance to uh, may, maybe offer you know, some really brief uh, concluding remarks on everything we've heard today from your the questions from the panel, from the direction of this conversation. Is there, is there a way, an idea you want to leave us with? Sure. I, I've been very pessimistic about the short term of AI. I think it's been very oversold. But I do think it eventually will be transformational. I think people should put in the work to do it better because we will have astonishing advances in medicine, technology, and so forth. We're not there yet, and we shouldn't delude ourselves into thinking that this is a five-year mission. But I don't think we should cut it off at the pass either. OK, well, so um, let me uh, thank all of you for uh